he's in a steady decline. That's the reality of keeping a person in a high security prison for years on end. Um, he's fighting for his life, so he's he's fighting. Um, and there are hope. There are moments of of uh, hope and even happiness. Like our wedding was a lovely um, moment of pure happiness, in spite of the uh, horrible surroundings. But even those surroundings softened uh, for you know an hour and a half. Uh, we had the ceremony with John and my mom and my brother Adrian and Gabriel and uh, even the staff seemed to soften and celebrate um, but that place is horrible I mean it is just uh, the opposite of uh, everything that's good about humanity it is a, a dark brutal place and that's where they placed him alongside murderers who are serving sentences for murder uh, and it is almost so monstrous that it is incomprehensible i think this is the big gulf that we are the challenge is to um to overcome this gulf of of uh, in comprehension that what is actually happening is so uh, absolutely monstrous that people turn away because it can't be happening, but it is happening. So um, it's happening. John and I are witnesses to it, to uh, you know the person I love the most uh, being treated in this way. And we're trying to tell everyone else what we're witnessing. And this is one way of doing it. Ben is, uh, Ben Lawrence, the director, he's a little bit like the Grand Inquisitor from Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. He knows that if he persists, he'll get it out of you one way or the other. So whether, you know, to make you slightly cranky or to like you, uh, um, his persistence and humanity it draws it draws the best out of you. Yeah, that's that's what it's like. Yeah, um, but it's a very kind film. I, I saw it once. I can't see it. It's very kindly. Also, uh, the tone. Uh, you, you know, you see a family together. Uh, struggling in every way, struggling, fighting in every way they can, a battle to get to Julian, who is a historical figure, not really for the persecution, although that stands as a flag at half-mast, but as a historical figure, uh, discovering a method and using forces of intellect and integrity and truthfulness to bring us gifts not himself but us that if you there's a, a young man or he's not so young 38 um his name is boffin and he has read every single of the every single one of the 250,000 um uh, cables over a period of five years. I know him in Melbourne. He can stand toe to toe with any generalist in the State Department or the Colonial Office. That's the sort of knowledge that is contained in those cables and you can go home now and look it up and get a view of uh, the Boris Johnson, for example, in the cables and many, many other significant people or not so significant who have uh, collapsed under the pressure of money or threat or who have, uh, and I'll give you a, a good example, it's a sort of uh, a little bit funny as well. So when uh, 
Raphael Correa became president, he had read some of the cables, and the cables <laughs> reveal that the U.S. Embassy was paying the wages of the elite police force, that is, the loyalty of the, the elite in the police force was to the U.S. Embassy. In so, yeah, sorry, in, in Ecuador. And so uh, he was able, from reading those cables, to, to come up with a solution, which was really elegant. He just made all of the other policemen get the same amount of money. That, that, that's just one. I'll give you another one, a quickie. Um, there, there are many. There's 250,000. Every single one of them will give you an insight. And that was brought to you by Julian Assange from WikiLeaks. 250,000. There's 400,000 uh, Iraq war. There's 90 odd thousand Afghan war files. The Iraq war files show you in detail the interior of a war crime extending over 20 years. A continuous, unfolding, murderous war crime. Anyway, the example I wanted to give from the cables is that the Chagos Islanders were taken uh, from the Chagos Islanders and dumped in Mauritius. And uh, the, one of the islands, Diego Garcia, was given to the United States as a gigantic Air Force base, which they have the B-52 bombers there so that they can threaten you. You. They can threaten Europe. They, that's the extent of their purview. Anyway, the Chagos Island lawyers read the cables and took a case based on the cables to the International Court of Justice and prevailed. They prevailed in that case. So there's two illustrations there of bringing justice. A third one, if you give indulge me, is a really important one. Iraq is a destroyed nation. The first thing the NATO did <coughs> was to bomb the water purification plants, 26 out of 28, which means the mums can't give their kids a drink of water without the fear that they have shit themselves to death from dysentery. Can you imagine that? Pouring a glass of water and in a horror and thinking your, your child will die from dysentery. Equally, it reveals the DU was used, depleted uranium, which when it explodes, falls into the finest of fines, which is blown on the desert wind and goes into the food chain. Of course, mums eat food. And the babies in their bellies turn to monsters. So a destroyed nation. Well, one of the cables illustrates uh, uh, an event just outside Baghdad in Iraq, about 2008. You can look it up. Where a group of American soldiers went into a house and destroyed the family, murdered them all. The boys and the girls, the babies, the mum and the dad, the grandfathers, grandmothers, uncles and aunties, all of them. Thinking they'd get into trouble for this heinous crime, they called it an airstrike. And obliterated from the earth, all traces of that little family forever gone. This was reported in a cable by the United States Ambassador to Iraq to the Department of State in Washington. The cable was seen by the parliamentarians, the, the bureaucrats in the institutions and the people of Iraq was published. It's, it's on WikiLeaks. You can look it up gathering up their courage, this destroyed nation refused to sign the Status of Forces Agreement. Such courage and so the foundation of that courage is a cable that sits on WikiLeaks to this very day. You can look it up yourself. You can confirm it. You can feel the tears run down your face as you read it. Anyway, that's, that's what 
Julian Assange, who sits in a little prison about this big, about that big, gets a visit once a week from Stella and the kids. Three years now. Doesn't seem right, does it? It doesn't seem right that the perpetrators of the most heinous crimes, the most heinous crimes, six million dead over 20 years, accused Julian Assange. That means a collapse into grotesquerie, a depravity which we must face every day that we get up and go on the trail to defend Julian. Anyway, thank you. Uh, well, when we started filming uh, this documentary, um, there was a need for it to basically to document you know it's uh there was a lot of filming day to day as you can probably tell at some point i just lost track of the camera rolling um and obviously it's very exposing you know uh, especially for someone like me that that's very private and, you know so it, it wasn't easy, but on the other hand, it just, uh, everything, um, it's all just to, to show the world what it's really like, you know, the reality, because there's been such a, a, uh, twisting of reality when it comes to Julian. And the only thing he could do was to show the reality, to try to counter it. And uh, that's what it's like when I'm speaking to Julian. I try to remind him of what life is like outside those walls. Because after a while, those walls become your world. You know? Uh, so, you know, even the most mundane things um just to remind him that there's a reality outside that he can touch and feel if he can imagine it uh, and so i try to be that connection to to the outside as much as i can um but you know this is yeah these are our lives um that we're exposing for everyone to see to remind people that Julian is a human being because he's just been so dehumanized and when you dehumanize a person you can do anything to them and we know that from history and that's what they're doing to Julian. Um, now we're appealing the uh, decision by the Home Secretary to green light the extradition. Uh, Pretty Goodell will gave her approval and we weren't surprised by that decision but um, something very interesting got reported recently that was missed by the British press by the way the Wall Street Journal had a leak <clears throat> that someone inside Priti Patel's office contacted the US government the Department of Justice asking the DOJ to publicly praise her for the decision to extradite Julian Assange. Now, think about it. They try to pretend like these decisions are like Pretty Patel was taking a quasi-judicial decision here. Why would there be a need to praise her? And she was seeking that praise. And the DOJ actually rejected it. They did not praise her. But someone did praise her, and that was Mike Pompeo. Mike Pompeo, who was the CIA director on the Donald Trump, who uh, in an investigation that came out last year, it was revealed had tasked the CIA to um, produce sketches and options about how to assassinate Julian, uh, kidnap him from the embassy, and, and so on, and deployed a massive um, CIA operation against WikiLeaks and Julian, which resulted in his 
arrest and imprisonment. Um, but those plans included assassination plans. And Mike Pompeo did praise Pretty Patel for the decision to extradite him. And then just last week, visited Pretty Patel. And Pretty Patel tweeted a, vis uh, a picture of the visit, uh, proudly saying her friend Mike Pompeo uh, had come to visit her and that she had hosted him at the Home Office. What is the Home Secretary of the UK? Well, no former, perhaps, I haven't called the news today, but... Is that an um, announcement? <laughs> no. We were thinking the question. cinema. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is the Home Secretary of the UK doing receiving a former US official who's not part of the Biden administration in the U UK Home Office and tweeting about it? Um, it's very sinister and her ties to um, um, CIA fronts are, are, have been reported on and so on. Uh, you know, this is a political case uh, with a very thin layer of legality to, um, you know, to wrap it up in a nice little bow. But the reality is that this is, that, that Julian is, is a victim of crimes. Um, he is not <laughs> he's not accused really of crimes he's accused of publishing the truth the truth that included evidence of crimes committed by u.s army personnel and so on and crimes have been committed against him and his lawyers and his family in the process of his political persecution um so sorry back to your question the high court uh now has our um our uh, um, submissions uh, for an appeal and they will decide on what grounds uh, they will hear over the coming uh, weeks or months. I'm not sure about the timeline. Um, the UK High Court will hear the, well, the grounds that we're appealing now are no longer um, just narrow grounds about uh, mental health and treatment in US prisons, but they go to the real substance of um, the press freedom arguments, the political motivation of this prosecution, the abuse of the US government, this CIA assassination revelations, uh, the, the plots to assassinate him and so on. All this will be central to our appeal grounds and you know we have um we hope the high court will want to hear these arguments the supreme court may um then hear the the arguments um on further appeal and ultimately at the european court of human rights but as you probably know uh the european court of human rights influence in the uk is up in the air um, following the government's intended uh, reforms to the Human Rights Act and so on. Well, the answer is it's a mystery what uh, is going on there. I mean, it's just most extraordinary that um, the, the Prime Minister resigns but says, I'm not going. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so, <clears throat> and you, the, the court cases are interminable. They go on forever. I, I keep counting them up, and it's 23 court cases and dozens upon dozens of, of hard-working lawyers. Uh, I don't expect, uh, uh, in a political case, I expect the political circumstances to change through us. Uh, yet today, uh, well, the Brazilian... Uh, a parliament in plenary session um, made a, a supporting statement. Uh, last night, uh, this in the Stras in the Luxembourg in Luxembourg Parliament, uh, they formed an Assange support group. In uh, France, uh, the uh, National Assembly of France, that's the National Assembly, the same as the Houses of Commons. The National Assembly of France debated whether 
to give Julian a asylum in France for an hour. That is really significant. Uh, the day before yesterday, uh, the Bundestag, uh, it's a petitions committee, which is really important because they can instruct the government, uh, made a supporting statement that Julian is a cross-party group. The Council of Europe reinforced its two-year-ago statement three weeks ago uh, that Julian is a protected journalist and must be free. The Human Rights Commission of the Council of Europe made a, a similar statement, and uh, as did the Austrian government. All of those statements mirror each other. There's 11 uh, parliamentarians in the Assange group in Norway, uh, 90 in, in uh, Greece, 30 odd, and it'll probably be 50 by the time we get home to Australia. So the, all of this started three years ago, just with two parliamentarians giving occasional support. Now, every single parliament in the West has an Assange movement within it of uh, growing numbers. I, I just try to illustrate to you that, that those pinnacles indicate us because the, those parliaments and uh, uh, politicians, they don't do any anything. I think there's a golden rule I read the other day that a, a government will do anything but govern. It's too hard. <laughs> um, but we, uh, you, all of us together, have brought about this circumstance that it's a worldwide movement. Even to, uh, the Chinese government and the Russian government you and the uh, the government of Azerbaijan used Julian's circumstance as a weapon against uh, the, the claims of uh, the United Kingdom and uh, the United States to press freedom. So the circumstance is an on-rolling, upwelling tide of support, for which I thank you very much. Well. The U.S. did everything it could to avoid the uh, content of the publications, and they did so by making unfounded uh, assertions about the publications, things that we still hear in the media today. I mean, these things have been uh, rebutted and, and conclusively refuted in the extradition proceedings about Julian's um, redacting the cables and his uh, taking care about the uh, protecting people that might come to harm and so on. It's all out in the open. It's all on record uh, by witnesses, independent third parties who witnessed what actually happened. But you still see these claims about recklessness and harm and, and so on. Always, it's one of these fixtures that I have to deal with in interviews regularly, and it gets a bit tedious. But um, but it seems like uh, they they haven't heard it, or uh, it's it's just a talking point, right? Um, Julian's uh, when he was when he first published the Iraq War Logs in twenty ten, he went to the UN. And he participated as a as a um, invited by an NGO to the UN's uh, human rights uh, review of the United States that happened to be in November 2010, right after the Iraq publication. And there's a press conference; it's online, in which he explains what he hopes will come out of the publications, and that is reform, that is, that the wrongs that had been exposed would be dealt with and that there would be a review of policy as a result. And uh, maybe that was the most threatening part of it, that maybe the U.S. would have to hold itself accountable in light of all these misdeeds and crimes being out in the open. Uh, and that was the perhaps why there was such an aggressive response 
because of the implications that such reform would have. Um, but, you know, uh, they, they tried to taint uh, Julian, and it's amazing, really. When, when I speak to people, I always encourage them to actually look for themselves at videos in which Julian speaks for himself. Because uh, whenever people uh, say what Julian says or thinks or whatever, it's, it's usually complete nonsense. Complete nonsense, and uh, and you know if you if you look him up himself when he's speaking, uh, you can see that he's a extremely reasoned, reasonable, compassionate, thoughtful person who's thinking creatively about how to solve problems such as you know injustice, injustice in very concrete terms, not just like abstractly, but um, that was the whole purpose of WikiLeaks, to try to uh, bring what he called scientific journalism, to get journalists to have, be able to be peer-reviewed, just like scientists are when they publish in academic papers. You publish the original source documents, you check whether there's any um, risk in relation to the source documents, you redra redact any uh, anything that you think might be um, put any person at risk, but the rest, if it's in the public interest, if it is of importance, legal, historical, political importance, and it belongs in the public domain, it should be published. And journalists can write and comment about those things, but the readers should also be able to check where they're getting um, their analysis, what they're basing it on. That was a, a huge uh, innovation uh, that WikiLeaks uh, has has brought into journalism, and uh, and you know the um, the U.S. government has attacked Julian because it doesn't want accountability; it wants fear. Can I explain? Who amongst the who amongst us would not burn and tremble with indignation when you see the executives who administer 20 years of murder in the Middle East, 36 million, Brown University, 36 million refugees, Gideon Polya, researcher, professor at Melbourne University, six million direct deaths. That these executives get up on their bully pit and say, Julian may have caused harm. How hideous. Who would not burn? tremble with indignation to see that, the reality of it. I can, there's a little bit more there, if I can dig it out of my head. No, it's, it's not a clear thought, so I'll leave it till next time we meet. But that, <laughs> that's, that is it with those, those those people actually administer. And then they, oh, that's the last bit. When they send the soldiers there, in the case of Iraq, four, uh, sorry, Afghanistan, 4,000 of them dead. They did it. Those who administer this foul crimes that we in the West have to carry upon our conscience. And the relief, in my view, the relief to the burden that they've thrust upon us with this, this ongoing catastrophe, our relief is to ensure that Julian gets out of the jail and goes home to his 
wife and family. That is our relief and that is the beginning, in my view, of the untangling of the last 20 years. Thank you. I get a bit worked up about that accusation. Can I just ask you to answer my question, though? I mean, I know... You know, the, the, the comment, uh, uh, whether it extends to NATO, NATO, which, uh, which crime you're interested in with NATO? Yugoslavia? It's the culture. It's the culture. Or, or, or Libya or something. Hasn't been dealt with, has it? Or Libya, you know. The, 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 the ongoing history of NATO is a burden for you. I'm an Australian and I have a single, I'm a single, uh, what do you call it? A single issue person, Julian Assange, to get home to his kids. That's my single concern until it happens. Well, uh, John Gabriel has been able to visit him recently. Um, and he is able to speak to other prisoners when he's outside of the cell. Um, for things like collecting food. He has to eat in his cell, but he didn't go out to collect food, uh, except when the prison has had COVID lockdown. Um, and uh, the yard um, on a, usually he can access the yard uh, unless there's a, like once a day for under an hour. Um, if he has a legal visit or a social visit on the, that coincides with the time that he would be out on the yard, then he doesn't have the yard visit. Um, so it's you know it's it's extremely um, an extreme extreme routine, uh, and uh, but obviously his social interactions are extremely limited with guards and prisoners and the people that the prison approves to be on his list of contacts. Uh, things like uh, his, the amount of money that he has in his weekly allowance will influence how many calls he can make and so on. Uh, he is, you know, he's, a, he's not serving a sentence. It is a, an environment in which he has no, um, he has no control over his uh, you know, no, no autonomy, basically, um, apart from, uh, yeah, the, the people he chooses to call, and, um, and that's about it. The point that John was making earlier, that we have to change our frame of mind that this is a legal case, that we should be thinking about what the next appeal is, and so on. The courts should never have heard this case. This is a political case through and through, and it will take a political lens, political understanding, political mobilization in order to stop this travesty. And, you know, it's absolutely true that there is a global movement for Julian's freedom. It is, you know, it is vibrant, it is inspiring, it is amazing. The UK is the main site of this battle right now, and it is where this has to be stopped. Julian is, in many ways, a taboo subject here. And that's partly because many people in the UK, in London, here in London, have partaken in his uh, persecution in, in so far as um, complicity with the US. Um, on the kind of in relation to the authorities, but uh, the press has been um, 
shameful for many years, uh, but that's changing. <laughs> and it's changed, in fact, I mean, over the past two years, uh, there is a lot more willingness to engage. It's not enough, but I think there's also a need to emphasize that Julian is not a marginal issue anymore, that all the organizations that matter are unequivocal about this. Amnesty International, Reporters Without Borders, uh, you name it, all the important organizations have looked into this case and see it for what it is. And that should be enough. And uh, there has to be some departure now, like turn the leaf and uh, turn the, the, the page now and just focus on Julian's freedom. Uh, you know, I have a lot to say about how people have behaved in the past, but frankly, it doesn't really matter anymore. And that's why, you know, I'm criticized for it, but I give interviews to The Guardian, and I give interviews to The Telegraph. Tomorrow there's a Telegraph interview, and, you know, I'm willing to engage with anyone. This uh, case has to be talked about constantly. It cannot be a taboo subject anymore, and, uh, you know, it's, it's down to principles, and it's not just about Julian and WikiLeaks. This case has very serious implications for press freedom in this country because this is going to the High Court now and that is creating legal precedent about the operation of the Official Secrets Act as it is now that it is able to operate in the same way as the Espionage Act. Basically, that what is being done to Julian can be done here exactly the same and that the scope of press freedom is going to be reduced by virtue of this case and it has a chilling effect already now it has to be reversed <clears throat> and there has to be an awareness in this country that this is a uk issue this is a, a matter that uh that concerns everyone it's not julian assange some sui generis thing this is about press freedom and democracy and the ability to report about government wrongdoing, because if they get away with this, then they will use it against UK journalists, British journalists reporting about the British government. Well, I hope you're all fired up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's uh, Nils Melson's book outside that's for sale. Um, it's called The Trial of Julian Assange. It's the equivalent in our age of Jacques by Emile Zola about Captain Dreyfus's persecution. Buy a copy or, or share a copy with your friends. There's also a little red bucket there with a sign on it saying donate. You can walk past that and put something in. It helps us keep going. There's t-shirts there. Uh, lastly, lastly, don't, I tried to finish on, you know, a, a description of where we are and how we are. And I take this from Lord Byron. Yet, freedom yet, thy banner torn but flying streams like a thunderstorm against the wind. We're a bit torn, but we stream like a thunderstorm against the wind. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.